So we are live streaming. All right. Welcome, everyone. Today we're going to talk about mastering the art of melee. This is going to be a basic introduction to melee combat. Uh, with me, I have Sir Pietro, I have Sir Eric Martel, uh, Sir Seamus, and Sir Joffrey. And, uh, and I am Prince Timothy of Meridies, and we're just going to be talking about melee. We've put together a handful of questions um, that are commonly heard that introduce us to melee combat. And we're just going to kind of, amongst us, field some of these questions in hopes of help, helping to demystify melee combat and what it all really means. So let's go ahead and kick this thing off with introductions. Uh, I want to go ahead and start with Sir Pietro. Pietro, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Introduce yourself to the world and let's get this thing started. Hi everybody, I'm Sir Pietro de Vitavia. I'm in the Shire Fork House out of Savannah. Um, I've been fighting for about 12 years now. And uh, as of this moment, I'm still the baby knight of Meridies. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty much it. I mean, I like fighting melees. It's fun. Thanks, Pietro. I'll go ahead and go next. I'm Prince Timothy of Meridies. I've been fighting since 1999, so I just hit my 21st year uh, in armor. And uh, I started my fighting in Aidenveld, came out to Meridies in 2002, and I've been here ever since. Uh, so the vast majority of my uh, fighting career has been here. Sir Eric, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm Sir Eric Martel. I'm the uh, Baron of Iron Mountain. Uh, I have spent the predominant amount of my time in the SEA war fighting. So this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. I am exclusively a sword and board war fighting snob and all glory to those guys in the shield wall. Amen to that. And Sir Seamus, who is now currently the general of the Meridian Army. Sir Seamus, will you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Sir Seamus. I've been fighting in 27 years, all in Meridies. Um, and like you said, I just stepped up as general. Not that I've had the opportunity to do a whole lot, but looking forward to. Thank you so much. And finally, Sir Joffrey. Hi, I'm uh, Sir Joffrey. I've uh, been active in the SCA uh, fighting for 34 years and lived in six different kingdoms. I uh, did about four years as the Meridian General, and I love melee. Thank you all for those introductions. Uh, our, we're going to kick it off with our first question now, and uh, this question is going to go to Sir Pietro. The question is, uh, what about melee is most appealing to you? Um, so melee is um, it's one of those things where it's not necessarily an individual like you got tournament you got you know singles combat and that's all about you and and your your prowess but in melee it's all about putting together different moving parts that come together and form this cohesive unit of destruction and if done right it is a beautiful symphony of just chaos and it appeals to me on so many different levels. And I love watching somebody start off and they're the very first melee and you can tell they're nervous, but by the time the first clashing of the shield wall happens and they hit the res point, they've got this smile from ear to ear and they're like, I want to do this again. This is great. So um, that's, that's one of the things I love. I love watching like groups come together to form one for one goal and and watch them win lose or draw just have a blast great so. answer thank you sir pietro and i couldn't agree more um let's go ahead and move on to our next question since we're getting a, a late start here we've got a lot of questions to roll through we're going to do our best to cover as many of them as we can the next question is uh when we're talking about melee what kind of battles are there and what makes them unique now i will tell you there are a lot of types of battles. So we're going to take turns kind of highlighting a few of these battles uh, and what makes them unique. We won't touch every option or every scenario, but this should at least give you a, a overview of kind of what we do. Let's start with Sir Eric. Sir Eric, would you talk about the field battle? This field battle is often known as an open field battle, which is self-explanatory in the name, 
what it essentially means is there are no artificial choke points, no artificially created barriers. There's purely an open combat area, which allows for greater troop movements and greater troop maneuverability. And Sir Pietro, the uh, if there was an opposite of the open field, I would say it's the bridge battle. Would you talk a little bit about a bridge battle? What makes it unique? Uh, like, like, uh, like you said, it's the exact opposite of an open field battle. It is trying to take a bridge, which creates a bottleneck. It is a grinder. It is basically a narrow area that you have to fight in, and your goal is to get to the other side. And it is brutal, and it takes a lot of creativity to um, be successful in them. It takes a lot of um, quick thinking. Um, you can't just put, and I learned this the hard way. Actually, Your Highness, you you taught me that lesson when you put me in command of my first bridge battle many years ago. Um, you can't just take your biggest guys and go, I want that bridge, now go get that bridge. Um, it takes a lot of, um, thinking on the move because, you know, it could start off and the other side has spears and how do you stop those spears? And it, it's, it's, it's narrow and it's quick thinking. Absolutely. Uh, next, we have a castle siege. Sir Seamus, would you talk a little bit about castle sieges or fort battles? Yes, uh, fort battles, kind of a, a mix of both because a fort usually has a big enough area outside and inside to be kind of many field battles, but then you have the bottleneck of the gate or the sally port or whatever it is that you're trying to get through. Um, so it's kind of a interesting mix of both. Uh, typically they're mostly attack and defend where you uh, hold it for so long defending and that's how you win. Or if all the attackers kill all the defenders, then that's how they win. So it's a very interesting type of battle. Thank you, Sir Seamus. Joffrey, would you talk about um, some of our unique terrain battles? There's battles like the Ravine and the Woods Battle at Gulf Wars. Uh, tell us a little bit about those. Well, the thing that makes these type of battles unique is the fact they are very broken ground. You may have areas that you cannot go into because there's a big dip in the ground or a bit of a, tr a trench or there's trees or big rocks in the way. So what you have to do as a commander is to think about that when you lay out your plans for the battle, how you're gonna maneuver your troops and make sure that they understand that as they move forward, that one big unit that you're trying to move into that, you know, that choke point down at, down at the bottom of the ravine or wherever is gonna to have to break up and then get back together to get around some of these obstacles. It also can limit your ability to charge because of uneven grounds and things like that. So it's just, it's a very broken, mixed up terrain that you have to learn to use to your advantage. And remember, the enemy's gonna be trying to do the same thing. So try to look ahead and see where you think they are going to try to use the terrain to, to their advantage. And that gives you a little bit of a heads up on how to counter it before they even start. Thank you for that answer. Um, just to kind of fill in some of the gaps, there's a number of additional types of battles from resurrection battles to unique niche scenarios like battles that recreate a point in history. Um, there are so many ways that these battles are fought to add variety, to add various forms of strategy and tactics, um, but they're all fun, uh, whether it be on a big field or whether it be in a a really consolidated choke point. Every battle has something about it that makes it special and fun for some. Let's go ahead and roll on to our next question. Um, and that question is, what are the weapon styles and what are their roles on the battlefield? Uh, Sir Seamus, let's kick this one over your way. Talk about weapon styles in battle. So the major styles that I would, I, I, I look at are, of course, sword and board. It's like your offensive line, defensive line. You can't have a a melee without it. Um, then you have your secondaries, greatsword and glaive, and then you have spears. I, I, I separate glaive and greatsword and spear because spear is its own little special, special in my mind. Uh, other people don't. Other people all put them together. But uh, again, you, your sword and board is your front line. You can't really do much of anything without guys with sword and board. Um, typically, your glaives 
your great swords, they take advantage of a situation that the shieldmen provide. And then you also have uh, spearmen that either can cluster up and become just spearmen by themselves doing spear duels or being effective behind the shield wall. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else, but basically uh, that's archers, the, oh, the combat weapon. archery. I forgot combat archery. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, no, it's very effective. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not one of those people that dislike it. Um, I have been killed many, many times with it, but <laughs> I have seen it change, change about uh, Gulf Wars specifically the ravine battle can, can change immediately because of the arrows, combat arrows. Um, so I, I think they're a very pivotal part. I actually seek them out and, and, and try to get them eliminated as fast as possible because they are that much of a threat. Thank you for that answer. Um, now you had talked about shield, sword and board uh, is a term that we use to talk about sword and shield. And there's a lot of different types of shield that we use. Uh, Sir Joffrey, would you tell us about what shield style is effective in a melee or a battle type scenario? Okay, well, it depends on your job, all right? So basically, if you're gonna be on a bridge where you're in a choke point or gate or something like that, having a large shield that is, uh, is, is fairly static is a very advantageous thing because it's gonna cover you better cover the people next to you, you know, give extra assistance in keeping everybody alive. If you need to be very mobile, you want a smaller shield, but something still that is, is of a size that offers a reasonable amount of protection. You don't want to come out with a little buckler or something like that because it's, you're not going to be able to protect. Even if you can protect yourself, you're not going to be able to protect the guys next to you. So choose your shield according to your job. Also, one of the things you want to look at is the type of shield specifically. If you notice the large scutums have very squared off corners and that allows it to stop a spear from sneaking up under the edge where a round shield might curve under. So as a general rule, I think those are a better shield. However, it depends again on your job. If you're gonna be out running around, not part of a static wall, such as if you're a flanker or, or an aggressor or something like that, then then any shield that you're comfortable with is your best shield because that's what you're comfortable with. But if you're static, try to look to the larger shields and utilize them accordingly. Thank you, Sir Joffrey. Now, we've talked a lot about battles, these big battles with lots of people, and we've all been doing this for years. Uh, one of the questions that I get a lot is, for someone walking right off the street, they want to get involved. What are the steps to get involved? What do they really need to do? Sir Pietro, would you talk a little bit about getting started in heavy combat and participating in melee? I would love to, Your Honor. Um, so getting started, just um, come to practice, ask questions, ask your marshal for melee training. Um, you know, this is, this is after a while. Usually, you know, um, I give fighters a couple of weeks, a couple of months before you know, I start introducing them, but I'll explain it to them. But before they actually get practical application, I want to make sure that they're safe, um, that they know what they're doing, that they understand what a telling blow is, you know, basic authorization stuff. Um, and then to get started, just show up to practice. Um, if there aren't fighters in your group that want to do melee, um, ask them who they can link up with. Um, direct them to somebody who does if that's not your thing melee is not for everybody I, I know many fighters who don't fight melee because it's just not their thing um but asking questions is probably the best way to get involved watching melees from you know previous melees on youtube um studying historical battles is actually super advantageous because they worked for a reason those guys were victorious for a reason. Those tactics work and we can modify them and what we do and make it work for us. Um, so just study, ask questions, show up to practice um, and see what works best. Um, it's not all about the sword and shield guys on the shield wall. It's not all about the spears. It's not all about the blades. Try every different aspect of it and see where you fit in. And that I think is the best way, in my opinion, that's how I work it. Um, 
I think that's the best way to get started is to ask the questions and see what works for you. Thank you, Sir Pietro. Now, once I've gotten my armor together, uh, I've gotten trained and I'm ready to go. I get out there and I'm in my first big battle. Let's say I'm at Gulf Wars. What's going to be my role on the battlefield as a newcomer? Sir Joffrey, would you field that question? Absolutely. Most of the time, most new fighters come to the battlefield as a sword and shieldman. It's a good place to start. And in many cases, it's a, it's a great place to stay. I've been fighting in melee for 35 years, 34 years. I am still primarily a sword and shield man. 10, 15, 20 times out of, uh, out of, out of 25, I'm going to be out there with my sword and shield. Because I love that shield ball. I love being part of it. So that's a good place to start. One of the things I would like to suggest, however, is whatever role that you are put into, be sure to ask the guys around you, is there anything specifically I, I should be doing? Uh, how are we going to do it? Can I, can I team up with you and follow you? So that's, that's your best role is being a sidekick to an experienced fighter who's doing the same job that you've been given. Because the commander is going to give you a job, find somebody who, who you can follow and learn from them. Great, great caveat into this next question. Who do I go to for commands? Uh, I know every kingdom works a little bit differently. So Seamus, you're currently the general of the Meridian Army. You want to talk a little bit about how we do things in Meridies in regard to command structure? Sorry about that. I had to unmute myself. <laughs> uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, command is... Uh, it's 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 unique in the uh, SCA or SCA fighting in comparison to military, in my opinion, or anything else that would have a command structure, because we're not really, it's not almost almost always obvious who is actually in command. Um, the way we set it up in Meridies is um, we have a general, then the general has an XO, Eric Martel, Baron Eric is my XO. Um, and then we, we, it goes down from there. Typically, you would look at it as knights or your officers. And then uh, we have a uh, fighting, uh, GOA level fighting uh, ward that we call the Legion of the Bear. A lot of other kingdoms have them, um, uh, different names. But uh, I, I look at those as like your sergeants in the army. So um, if you know of them as a bear, you can't get to the general, you can't get to the XO, um, you can't find a knight or whatever. Those are probably your first step. The same, uh, I don't want to say same level. That seems wrong to say that it's a lesser level. But, uh, you know, they're, they're, I always look like, like I said, I always looked at them as the enlisted. Um, and uh, they will find one of them if you can't find the general. Of course, if I'm the general and you have a question, you can just easily come up and talk to me. I don't care who you are. Uh, everybody's important. Everybody's a cog in the wheel. So, uh, but really, to answer the question uh, easily, whoever actually looks like they're giving commands and doing a good job of it is probably there and then the right person to ask. So you can have a command structure all the way from a formalized command structure down to someone looks like they know what they're doing and they, they might have a good plan to follow. Uh, so command structures are absolutely very flexible. Now, stepping outside of the battlefield for just a moment, let's say that I want to get involved, but I'm not ready to fight. Uh, what are some ways that non-fighters can get involved? Uh, Baron Eric, you want to help with that? I'd be glad to, Your Highness. Throughout the course of my SEA experience, I've sort of likened war fighting to collegiate sports. You don't have to be on the field to be part of the team. When you back your kingdom, you're in a very real way supporting it through your enthusiasm and through your efforts. And I don't want to discount the fact that there are tangible things that you can do that we'll talk about. But when you're there on the day of the battle in your kingdom colors with your banners flying and the fighters all look to the sideline and see you there giving your kingdom cries, that's a really very awe-inspiring part of the SCA experience. It's that part of the SCA that truly comes closest to those fictional books that we've read or those historic accounts of battles that, that are clearly written with 
an uplifting theme. That will be the single biggest point of the dream for many of you that you will ever see is that moment on the field when the battle's about ready to start and your kingdom is crying out for your victory. Now, there are things you can do to help that are actually tangible. Make certain that the fighters that you know and the fighters that you don't are properly hydrated, that they have help getting their equipment to the field if they need it. You can even help them make their equipment if that's where your talents and interests lie. But the reality is what they need most of all is your enthusiasm about their efforts for your kingdom. Because in this real way, you're all part of the same team. Mm -hmm. Great answer. Great answer. And uh, I got a question here um, through a private message that I want to go ahead and field now. Uh, this one's from David. And now you talked, Sir Eric, I want you to try to field this one if you can. Um, he talked, we talked about how inspiring uh, being a non-fighter or a fighter can be on the field, seeing kingdoms get united. Um, but sometimes uh, there is a perception that melee combat can bring out the worst aspects of fighters. So while a tournament might be a very sanitized environment where the two fighters are under the microscope, a few more things might slip through on a big and tumultuous battlefield. So how do we uh, get over bringing about the worst of those fighters? How do we handle those situations uh, in a graceful manner to continue to promote uh, melee combat? Well, the first thing I have to say is that we become who we are when we're most under pressure. So if you believe melee combat is the most pressurable point of martial activities, then great good guys are going to be great. And those who are less so will be much less so. What we do in that regard is we have to look out for our brothers. None of us is perfect. All of us make mistakes. We have to hold each other accountable. If we misbehave or act poorly, we have to stop that where it stands to point out where that person has made the mistake and then help direct them into a better path so that they can continue to do this going forward. We also have to acknowledge that responsibility to the people who are watching. As we say, we're all on the same team. We want the cheers of the gallery. We want them to be with us at all times. We do not want them to be ashamed of us. Because of that, we have to listen and then we have to understand and then be better. A great answer. And uh, Pietro, can you talk a little bit about the systems that we have in place um, specifically to promote safety and accountability on the battlefield? Uh, so, uh, well, there's authorization, of course. Um, there is uh, everybody's magical stop where it holds. Um, and um, like Baron Eric said, um, it's policing each other you know, um, watching out, making sure that, you know, people aren't overreacting and um, getting a little too intense or crazy. Um, I, I'm guilty of that on occasion. Uh, I have also had to correct people um, of that. Um, and is our training. This is why you can't just walk out onto a field after your first practice and I'm authorized. I'm going to go fight in a melee. I'm going to go fight in a tournament. It takes time. It takes a, a deep understanding of the rules. Um, so that's, that's how I see it. That's the short version. <laughs> Thank you for that answer. So naturally what we do, it can be dangerous. We're putting on heavy armor. We're going out there uh, against some very large individuals. We're, we're fighting with a lot of uh, ferocity and tenacity in a full contact sport. Um, there is some potential for injury there. And one thing I hear a lot is, uh, how often do people get hurt? Um, how do you keep people from getting hurt? Sir Eric, do you want to take that one? I will. Um, like all sports, we have injuries. In my experience, the rate of injury in the society is significantly less than most of the other sports that I've taken part in. And part of it is because of the attention to detail from marshals inspecting armor to the marshals keeping a wary eye out during the battles for people who may be in a position where they can injure themselves. But the truth of the matter is, is the people involved also bear a certain amount of responsibility for their own safety. One, you have to understand your own physical, physical limitations. If you're not a track star, don't try to be one. 
don't take risks that you are not capable of withstanding physically. Also be aware of things such as heat exhaustion and dehydration. These are real things that affect people in the society combat on a weekly basis. You have to bear some responsibility for yourself for staying hydrated and keeping yourself safe. You also have to have situational awareness. Understand the field around you. If you get an opportunity, you should walk every battlefield before the battle starts. Understand where the high points are, the low points are, any holes in the ground, any uneven areas that might cause you to stumble or fall. You also need to keep your head on a swivel, so to speak. You need to be looking around you, understanding how the flow of the battle is going, because otherwise you can take a pretty hard shot from an opponent who may not understand that you are completely unaware of their presence. Don't overdo it. Be safe. Fight with joy. Fight with tenacity. Be a savage. But understand that you, as we all, have limitations and that you need to keep those in mind and your own safety as the paramount objective. We all want to walk off the field together and then share an adult beverage. Absolutely. Now, I got a message from uh, Master Edward of Yarborough, who is on with us. And it's kind of to address that uh, when Melee brings out the worst in fighters. Uh, he wanted me to add, when all else fails, bring them to the Earl Marshal. So in just talking about another thing we do have is the marshals on the field. We do have individuals who are there. They have a staff that has kind of spiral tape, like candy cane uh, pattern tape to identify these marshals. And they're kind of there to help govern safety. These are individuals whose, whose job on the field is to make sure that everything's safe and all these marshals report up a chain that goes all the way to Master Edward, who is our Kingdom Earl Marshal. Um, so he's the, the ultimate voice in regard to uh, helping to promote safety and heavy combat in our kingdom. Now, uh, Sir Eric had mentioned about when this, at the start of battle, kind of clearing your head and, uh, and preparing yourself. Let's talk a little bit about that. Right at the beginning of battle, uh, Pietro, I'm gonna have this one uh, go your way. What's running through your head as a battle is about to start? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to... Um, uh, usually I'm looking at, um, well, me personally, in my mind, I'm, I'm looking at my troops. I'm looking at how ready they seem. I'm going over their armor to make sure they're, you know, quick visual inspections. Um, looking at, our, at their equipment, making sure they are where I want them to be um, for what I want them to do. And then I look over to the opposing side and if I need to adjust, I'll adjust. Um, usually what's going through my mind is Murphy's Law and um, you never know what's, what's gonna happen. So I'm always working contingencies and letting my guys know, okay, if this happens, let's try to do this. And if this happens, let's try to do this. Um, there's a lot of things running through my head, but those are the, the main ones that are always running through my head. Um, I laugh because I wanted to keep a PG. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's, it's basically um, looking at all the, uh, all the things that are going on at that moment and trying to focus and, and create a, a plan as quickly as possible. Absolutely. Sir Joffrey, what are your thoughts on that same question? Uh, what's running through your head at the beginning of a battle? Well, having been in the commander's position for quite a while, one of the things that I think that everybody, everybody should be thinking about is three things, the scenario, the objective, and the plan. The scenario is it's a bridge battle. It's going to be a resurrection battle. That's the basic scenario. Everybody should know that. Uh, the objective is not necessarily to kill everybody because it's in a, a, a resurrection battle, but it's to hold more than half that bridge and make sure that the marker is flipped to your color. So the plan is now, what is the plan? The plan is to push the enemy back, hold them three quarters of the way on that bridge and make sure that that, that banner stays flipped. Now, if everybody knows those three things, then the battle will progress a lot smoother for, for the, for the uh, commanders as well as for the entire army. Everybody knows what the objective is. They know that when they get past that banner, it needs to be flipped. And so if you don't forget the little things, then 
the battle will, you know, more likely have a better chance of going your way. But those three things, scenario, objective, and plan. Great answer. Thank you, Sir Joffrey. Um, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, during my brief tenure as general, it was all about know that we know what battle is about to happen, know the, how we win that battle, and what we're going to do to make that, that occur. Um, so if everyone knows that at the beginning when they're going in, uh, we're one step ahead. We had a few more questions come in. I'm going to do my best to field those now. Um, what is the best place for people of a non-standard size to line up uh, some people who are particularly tall like myself or particularly short uh, might feel more advantageous in certain areas or less advantageous. So any suggestions uh, here on where people of non-standard sizes should line up? Let's use a gate, uh, a gate in a castle as the uh, scenario here. Sir Seamus, do you have any thoughts on this? Yes. Um... Especially for uh, people of Timothy's height, uh, their uh, and, and 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 reach is more important with the Timothy part or the height, the tall people. Uh, second line is amazing for those kind of people. If you're if they're breaching a castle, I don't really want the really tall guys on the front line. Uh, second second line in would be great because they can reach over, they can reach uh, around. If they have a spear, they're super deadly that way. Um, on the breach, uh, short people, uh, shorter people, usually do fairly well up front. Uh, they can also be in the second, but uh, we have some uh, uh, several very short people in our kingdom and they tend to get overlooked and they tend to get kills because of it. Uh, people are swinging high, high at the, at the head or high at the uh, weapons coming up from above and don't tend to pay attention to the shorter people. Um, of course, I, I think, you know, you would go to your strengths when you find them, but uh, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see any reason that the, that the short person, like I said, could be up front or in the back and wait till it all clears out and be in the cleanup crew. That also works well for both either heights of either heights. I'm sorry. All right. Um... This next question comes in from Rachel, and she says, as a more experienced melee fighter, what should we be doing to make sure our newcomers are safe and doing well in their first few fights? Uh, I'll go ahead and take that one myself. If you have been involved in the training of a new fighter, if there's someone from your local group, if there's someone uh, who goes to your regular practices and you see them in their first melee, pull them under your wing. Um, there's nothing worse than having a brand new fighter with that feeling of being alone or not knowing anyone around them. So just by the nature of pulling them in to be a part of a unit, you have some accountability over that person. Uh, you can help to show them how to communicate amongst their comrades and what we can do together. Um, and that's going to help provide a little more security for that individual and that level of confidence boost that's going to help to keep them safe. All right, so uh, we had another question come in from Nikon, and he says, how do you feel your fitness uh, or the fitness of your teammates affects your team's performance regarding victory or defeat? Do you see fitness having a positive or negative impact? Sir or Baron Eric, will you address that one? I'd be glad to. So first of all, let me go ahead and say that having anyone on the field, assuming they are physically capable of safely fighting is an asset. And there will be a place that we can use that person make use of their skill, make sure they're safe and enjoy it, and we want them to be with us. That said, obviously, physical conditioning can be a limiting factor depending on the scenario. If we're in an open field battle and I send a unit to make a sweep right to flank our opponents, that unit can only move as fast as the slowest person in it. In a perfect world, we would all be Olympic athletes we would rival Spartans in our physical fitness and our war prowess, and we would perform that way. But we live in the world that we have. I do believe that it is part of war training to work on your physical fitness. That is a personal belief of mine and one that I hope that I practice as well as I preach. So yes, 
physical conditioning can have a negative impact on performance in wars. It can also have a positive impact on performance in wars and melees. But the reality is, is that most of the people involved in this will not be specimens of Olympic or collegiate caliber athletes. And we all will do what we can and we must to make sure that our sites succeed. And that's just the reality of it. So uh, how do we get a group of fighters to fight as a cohesive unit? So you have a number of people from all over the kingdom uh, coming together for a war. How do we get these people to fight as one? Pietro, do you want to field that one? And Pietro, you are muted. Sorry about that. Um, so, um, how do you how do you build a cohesiveness in a unit? Um, there's different ways. It's uh, it starts at starts at the smallest level, um, the shire level, canton level, barony level, whatever the smallest unit is. Um, I actually believe it starts there. It, it's building in the army. It's called the esprit de corps. Um, it, it's it's preached a lot in the military. Um, you're building pride in your in your local group. You're building an, an identity for your local group. You're you're taking people from different walks of life, and and you're you're giving them a common goal, uh, a common banner to rally around. Um, in my shire, we. Uh, we started doing uh, tabards, matching tabards with our Shire device on it. And at first the Shire was, was we all got along. We were all friends. And something happened during that project, during us working week in and week out, um, creating the design, sewing everything together. Um, but something happened in that moment or in that time. And we all, got tighter, we got closer, and we had a strong, stronger sense of pride. Um, and when we debuted, it was a uh, uh, Castle Wars, uh, 20, this past Castle Wars. And I looked out and I saw them all and you could see the pride they had. Um, and, and I strongly believe it starts at the lowest level. It starts with building pride in your, your local group and, and then expanding that um, to you know your kingdom and and it just grows from there. Um, but working together and and keeping everybody involved and and even the quietest person, even if they're they show up but they don't really talk, but they're there. That that's making them feel part of the group and that builds a a level of camarader camaraderie and a sense of belonging. And once you have that you're willing to fight with the guys that you see every week and you're willing to stand out there and, and take on any single group or person alongside them. Sir Joffrey, what are your thoughts on the same topic? How do you get a group of people to fight together as one? Well, when you're talking about on a kingdom level, you know, Sir Pietro is correct. You start off on the local Shire levels and so forth like that. But one of the things I like to see is also trying to take it to a regional level so that you end up in the, having regional fighter practices and discussions and so forth and trying to create camaraderie amongst the local groups in the region. So that when, that, when the, there's a, a battle, a war upcoming, those commanders of those small shires take it as a, as a unit and bring them all together and try to work it as a as a regional unit, and I think that's that's one of the best ways to look at it. So having a within the command structure, having a regional commander also works well to help organize and orchestrate that. Great answer. Uh, we had a question come in from Wes who asked, uh, "Have we talked about a res battle tactics versus non res tactics?" And we have not yet. So. I'll go ahead and do my best to, uh, to talk on this for a moment. When we're talking about a res battle or a non-res battle, that's not as important as what Joffrey had mentioned earlier. Uh, what are the terms of victory? 
So it's less the battle that you're fighting that determines your strategy and more your terms of victory. If the battle involves time, then that's where I'm going to be using my life a little, uh, a little more recklessly. Because on a timed battle, the, I, I have to get through a castle gate or I have to get across a bridge before that clock expires. We need to be aggressive to make that happen, very aggressive. Um, but if it's not a timed battle, whether it be a res battle or a non-res battle, uh, I tend to think of it and use every life sparing you fight to the best of your ability. So I don't have a lot of difference there. So I really think when we're talking about the way that we fight in a res versus non-res battle, it more depends on the terms of victory on how we use our lives or how aggressive or passive we are in that given, uh, in that given strategy. Another question just came in. If someone is new to melee, but they have a couple years fighting in their lo local group, where would they be most useful on the field? Sir Seamus, uh, do you wanna address that one? Where would we put someone who has a medium level of experience? Well, I would think that if they're uh, not much of a melee fighter, then they're probably gonna do sword and shield. Um, I personally think you should always start off on the wall, on the wall or in front. Uh, you get to see a lot of stuff. You get to understand the war a lot better. Uh, how people move, how, uh, how people react. Um, but again, uh, wherever you like, I, I say, you know, you take, you, you take, your, take a battle or two and fight in the front, take a, a battle or two and fight second rank, see what, the, what happens with that, you know, uh, also go to reserve um, and see what they do. Uh, you should, I believe you should experience every part of it just to see where you're the most comfortable. But where I would start is the line. Um, it's, like I said, it's the, the best place to start and uh, probably the easiest to learn, I think. Seamus, uh, kind of related to that, you as general, when you are choosing where certain individuals, someone comes up to you and says, uh, Sir Seamus, where do you want me? Um, where does your knowledge of their fighting style, does your knowledge of their skill level impact kind of where you put them as far as tactics are concerned? Do you kind of uh, pick where you send people based on, based on their skills? I do, absolutely. Um, if I know them and know their, their level of skill, then of course I'll send them where I think they're, they're, you know, if this is a big strong lad that has a nice big shield, then I'll put him up front. If he's uh, somebody that likes to run around, as we were talking about with fitness, if, we, if I get a couple of guys that are super quick and like to run around, then I'm going to do something else. I'm going to hold them in reserve or have them as a flanking unit. Um, if I don't know you, though, I'm automatically going to straight look uh, start by just looking at your equipment. Does he have a big shield, a uh, big sword? Is he carrying a, a glaive, an axe, uh, you know, and then kind of make the decision from there, um, you know, spear. Obviously, you're going to put them in different places, but, you know, really just depends on more than anything, they're kind of their attitude. Uh, as you talk to them, hey, where do you want me? I can kind of tell if they're nervous or if they're, uh, or, uh, you know, if they've experienced or whatever. And I'll, I mean, it's, it's fairly easy to figure out if they can handle being up front or need to, you know, stay back a little bit and watch what's going on. Thanks for that answer. Uh, I like this next question. Um, how can you tell if a battle is going your way and what do you do when it's not? Sir Joffrey, do you want to take that one? There we go. Oh, there we go. It's pretty easy to tell uh, if a battle is not going well. The, the guys over there are getting closer when you don't want them to. Uh, <laughs> There's a couple of different answers here, depending on where you are in your in in the command structure. Okay, as the guy on the line, if the battle's not going your way, you can tell that the, your your lines are getting overrun. Keep doing your job, but listen, be more attentive to changes in the commands that you're going to get. Look to the look around, see if, if you can find somebody who's senior who is actually trying to correct the issue immediately, right where it's happening. But specifically, do listen for for commands coming down from the uh, generalship or the or the commanders, the sergeants uh, coming around and actually telling you to change things 
to help fix the situation. If you're a commander, you're usually sitting back, such as the general, you're usually able to actually have a better view of what's going on. One of the things I think you should be very aware of is not only your reserves, but if it's a battle like Gulf Wars, your neighbor's reserves. So a bridge situation, your bridge is starting to, starting to collapse. Things are going really bad. You've committed your reserve, you've got it stopped. Let the commanders next to you on, on, the, on the next bridge no, you've got a problem. Don't just stand there and wait for your bridge to fall. Think ahead, plan ahead. Let them know that you may need the reserve if they're willing to give it, or at least be prepared for when this bridge falls because it's gone badly, to be aware that you're gonna have a problem on their flank. So look ahead, listen to the, listen to the commands that you get, be aware, and somebody mentioned earlier, keeping that swivel going, always keep an eye because you know, if you do get flanked, you don't wanna get overrun you know, and not be aware, so. This next question is a fun one and this one's for Sir Eric. Do arrows hurt? The short answer is yes. The long answer is yes, but your equipment goes a long way in determining exactly how much they hurt. You get to decide how much armor you wear on the field whether or not you value protection or maneuverability. As such, to some degree, you determine exactly how much those arrows hurt. But yes, they hurt. They hurt a lot. They hurt me. I can absolutely second that. I've had my fair share and some. Um, this question came in from Carl, and Carl asks, do you find it more beneficial to place individuals based on their skill set uh, than their melee experience. For example, a good tourney guy uh, as a flanker versus having them in a static line. Um, and I'll go ahead and try to field this one. And if anyone else wants to jump in, you're absolutely welcome. Um, all of these things and more factor into where a general or where a commander will put someone. Uh, sometimes the position on where everyone goes is difficult. Um, we've had situations in Meridies where literally uh, three quarters of the army wanted to be the flanking unit. And we had to, despite their skills or how best fit they were for that, we had to say, hey, not everyone can be the, uh, the hammer. We do need an anvil. Um, so a lot of decisions factor into that. But uh, skill set, melee experience, their kit that they're using, all of those things absolutely factor in um, to kind of where they, they would want to be. And just because they might be a great tourney fighter doesn't necessarily mean they'll be a better flanker, sometimes the, that tourney fighter can be an impressive, um, can be an impressive line fighter as well. In fact, I'm discovering this more and more myself. I've fought spear quite a bit in the past, and I've always liked to run off to the, to the corners and the angles with my spear. Uh, and I've recently started fighting more with my sword and shield and learning more about tournament fighting um, as I've wanted to, uh, to be a better competitor in crown list. Now, what's great about that and becoming a better tournament fighter is as I start to incorporate or integrate onto that line, I build the confidence of the people around me. Um, I become a good threat for spears, so I, I draw in a lot of attention. Um, so there's absolutely things that, you know, I could be a good distraction on the side, but I can also be a great distraction right in the middle of that line. So there's so many factors that go into who gets positioned where. Uh, Sir Seamus, do you want to chime in on that one as well? Yes, um, I agree with everything that Timothy said. Uh, the one thing I would add, a little experience, if you're, a, if you're a tournament fighter and you're not really used to melee, you may have blinders for that single target in front of you. That has been an experience in the past is that um, melee fighters typically have a, uh, try to keep their eyes open wide. Uh, a single tournament fighter, when he gets into the heat of it, might concentrate on one guy straight in front of him and then get killed from the side. So that's uh, kind of some, that's the, really the only thing I wanted to add to that is. Sure. And Sir Joffrey, this next question is for you. Um, what is the most important aspect of command when commanding a battle? I would say that the most important aspect is, is communication. You can have a great plan you can see something happen that your army can take advantage of, but if you have no system to communicate that to the army, 
then those moments will pass. Those abilities, those those chances will be lost. So making sure that you've got your, in, in the case of Meridies, our, our sergeants, which is our Legion of the Bear, we have our knights and so forth that are all aware of, of, of the general plan to communicate it, make sure it's happening, but also having specifically runners or people who are standing close to you who have a very good voice who can actually bring out those new commands as things change to be able to communicate on the battlefield is also very important, specifically in scenarios such as Gulf Wars, when you've been out there as a, as a general, I was out there for all week long, beginning of the war, I could put my voice anywhere I wanted. By the end of the war, I could barely whisper to the guy next to me. So again, bringing in additional communication systems to stand nearby, I tell them and they yell out the commands was always key to making sure that the commands got to the, to the troops. So I would have to say communication. And so Seamus, what are your thoughts on that same question? What's that most important aspect of command? I think the most important part, especially for the general, is to be fluid, not to be set. This is the plan we were going to have. This is what we're going to do no matter what. And no, no plan ever lasts past contact. So I think you have to be fluid, understand what your people are capable of, and then be able to adapt to, to the situation that comes in because they, they always, always change. Absolutely. Uh, Baron Eric, um, here's a question that came in from Rachel, and I was hoping you might help with this uh, or provide your insights on this. Do command manuals help folks understand commands and maneuvers and melee situations, or do they muddy the waters? I think they do both. I think that when we're talking about very simplistic ideas, command manuals can be an effective way of communicating the basic idea of certain strategic topics or tactical maneuvers. However, if they become too complex or too detailed or just too much information at all, we're not professional soldiers. We have limited amounts of time and limited amount of training time, particularly in large numbers. All the reading in the world will not set with you if you don't have the opportunity to practice it. So while I do believe that the basic concepts can be distributed pre-training and that, ha that can have a positive effect, I find that if it gets overly complicated, it can be a serious negative. People have a tendency to blank at the point of contact and to forget all of it. So I would say that on a very limited basis, it's a very good thing, but beyond that, I would avoid it. I absolutely agree. One of the thing I would add is they do help with continuity um, from one general to the next, the way that commands are given, the way that uh, commands are communicated. A manual could help to standardize those things, but just as, uh, as Baron Eric said, unless you drill it and practice it, uh, it's not gonna matter once you hit the battlefield. And that kind of rolls into this next question. Uh, Sir Seamus just mentioned that uh, no plan survives initial engagement with the enemy. So um, after the battle gets going and people are shuffled and mixed up, uh, and how does this impact the command on the field in the heat of the moment? Uh, so after you have a plan, you've communicated it to your forces, um, and then that plan doesn't survive initial engagement. What happens at that point? Um, I'll go ahead and take a crack here. And if anyone else wants to chime in, just let me know. Um, but it's true that almost no plan survives initial engagement. As long as your unit knows the objective and how to accomplish that objective, the terms of victory, then people in the units can uh, basically compartmentalize their command structure. So let's pretend that an army has just been cut in half and your commander is dead. Well, now you're going to need two commanders. You're going to need someone in command of each of those smaller units still pursuing your objective. Now, let's say that both of those units get cut in half. You're going to need another commander of each of those smaller units. So the key here is, even though the plan didn't survive engagement, even though the army is now cut and scattered, we need to have people ready to step up 
and take field command to continue to pursue the objective. It takes a lot of initiative. It takes a lot of thinking outside of the box or, or battlefield kind of uh, thinking fast and being creative. Uh, these are points that Sir, Sir Seamus absolutely emphasized that you have to be flexible. Um, but the key is, is just always having someone ready to step up. In the Kingdom of Meridies, we actually have an order uh, that kind of um, acknowledges who those individuals are based on their performance in battles, and that's the Legion of the Bear. If you have a history of leading, of stepping up, of filling that role, uh, we know we can typically count on that individual um, to take the lead when things don't go as planned and, and continue to pursue that objective. Uh, the Legion of the Bear is a good way to recognize those individuals. Sir Joffrey, you also wanted to speak on this? There we go. Um, yes, as Sir Timothy was saying, you know, we do have a Legion of the Bear whose, whose uh, job does reflect sub-commanders and, so, and so forth within the army. But a lot of times when you end up in those situations where, you know, things just went horribly awry, you are scattered out, you know, there's no cohesiveness. You, sometimes there's not a knight, there's not a commander, not a, a member of the Bear who's close by to actually start yelling that rally cry, to, to bring together, because you want to bring that, you know, those, those 10 guys who are just scattered out, you want to bring them back into a unit of 10 so that they can actually now go and create you know, havoc on smaller units around them. Sometimes that's going to be you. It just somebody has to step up. Somebody's just got to be the guy, figure out, hey, there's nobody around taking command. Well, then I'll have to do it. So always keep in mind when in melee, at some point, you may be the guy who has to take charge of a small unit. Now, don't go stepping on the commanders, things like that. When things are going the way they should, just follow their orders. But if it's become total chaos and nobody else is doing it, sometimes it's going to be you. Thank you, Sir Joffrey. Uh, Sir Pietro, uh, I had a question come in from Nikon. And I was hoping you could help with this one. It says, how do you go about encouraging melee practice in your local group? Nearly every practice I've been to has been focused more on 1v1 combat. And melee practices seem to have low turnouts, but plenty of people still do show up for the war events. So how can we encourage melee practice? What's been effective for you in Fourth Castle? Uh, usually what works for me, or what has worked for me is, uh, I share stories. I share uh, crazy things that I did um, in melees. There's a story of me and my squire brother at the time uh, charging so hard we knocked the enemy opposing force back to their res point and we had to have the battle stopped because we were just literally killing them right on the res point. They had to sit us back five feet because we charged them like mad dogs. We might've gotten in trouble for that. I don't remember. <laughs> um, actually, I think you might've been on that team with us, uh, your highness. Uh, <laughs> but- so You're uh, using your war stories to generate enthusiasm yes, for war. Yes, I share stories. Um, and then sometimes at practice, I just decide, hey, I'm gonna teach you guys how to use a spear and I'm gonna teach you guys how to stop a spear. And even if it's just me, having them beat me down with, with with their sword and board while I have a spear, it starts getting that little little bit of curiosity, that little bug in their ear like that goes, huh, maybe this might be fun. You know, if it's, you know, or me or them with a great sword and we do great sword versus great sword or glaive versus glaive. I'm not a fan of glaives, but you know. Um, <laughs> But, or we do, hey, look, I happen to have a combat crossbow. You wanna see what it does? So you just do little tiny things to pique curiosity and to pique that interest. And if you do it little by little, eventually they'll be like, hey, I want a spear duel. Let's like, I'm tired of getting beat up with a spear or beating you up with a spear. What happens if it's, spear on spear and then you go yeah that's a great idea and if you have an extra spear you bring that spear and you're spear dueling in practice and then next thing you know you're like hey you know what how about us two and then you grab somebody else and this guy with this with the shield how about 
we go against you guys and we see what happens. And next thing you know, your group is going to be like, yo, we should do that again because this is going to be a lot of fun and let's just keep doing it. So it's, it's, it's little by little by little. Eventually you have melee training and they didn't even know, they don't even realize that you did it. So that's, that's the word for me over here. Well, thank you very much. Sir Seamus, are there any cases where a smaller force could defeat a larger force on the battlefield? And uh, do you have any examples of that happening in your experience? Um, yeah, of course there are, there are cases. Uh, you know, historically that was absolutely the case, but uh, there's been several times where a smaller force has overcome a larger force. Uh, good example, funny example, uh, Gulf Wars several, several years ago, we got we were doing a field battle and a lot of us got pushed up into the corner and that, the, the battle kept going well by the time we got there the two armies had uh through attrition taken each other out mostly till there was half our number and we just walked over them so technically we were a smaller force i guess we were the bigger force at that point but because we got held up in a corner and we're smaller we moved in uh, another good example uh defending a, a castle or attack and defend of whatever kind but defending um a smaller group can also absolutely uh last and out especially because most of those are done by time and if you can just hold out longer than when they redo it then yeah you can win that way there's there's plenty of examples thank you and i can't agree more uh there's there's a lot of examples where a smaller unit has defeated a larger force sometimes it's that little action on the battlefield that causes a domino effect. I've seen one person flank my unit and then we ignored them because they were just one person while we pursued the bulk of the force and the damage that that person caused to our flank was something that we couldn't recover from. So it was arguable that the actions of one effective flanker uh, cost us that battle. I've seen one or two talented combat archers completely turn the tide of a battle by making strategic targets of talented spears, other archers whittling down the front line of an opposing force. I've seen knights, just a dozen knights, stand up against 50 unbelted fighters and give them a fight of their life. Um, so there are things like talent, positioning, uh, opportunity, all of these factor in. So one thing I want to leave everyone with is that you simply can't ever count yourself out. Um, the battle is always winnable. If you have one person and with a weapon still in their hand on that field, they can absolutely still win. Uh, so I want to go ahead and do one last question today. And that question is for Sir Seamus. Uh, Sir Seamus, what changes, if any, uh, would you like to see uh, from the leadership toward the army? Uh, what changes uh, would you like to see in regard to the Meridian Army? Huh. Well, I would like a, I would like to know from my my Meridian Army specifically that question. Um, is there anything you would like to see from me? But on my end, uh, changes of communication or step down in command. I, uh, we've done a great job with uh, with our last few generals for sure about command and, and knowing who's in charge if the commander uh, dies or, or leaves the field for whatever reason. But I would like to, uh, I would like to emphasize that more. And if you feel like you want to help as a Meridian soldier, then please come contact me or, or Baron Eric and uh, uh, ask us what you can do. Ask us how you can help. Uh, we, uh, we always, always want to hear from everybody that's fighting. Uh, everybody makes a difference. Like Sir Timothy said, you know, one guy left uh, can change the whole thing. So uh, either contact me through this page or whatever, if you have opinions or questions directly, and I will try to answer them the best I can. All right. And as we are now running short on time, I want to go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, we've, sorry for the late start. I hope this has been beneficial uh, for everyone here. 
Uh, I hope you've learned a little bit more about melee fighting. And maybe as Pietro said, I hope this planted a seed, a little something that's going to roll into more enthusiasm for you as a war fighter. Uh, war fighting is a passion. And I know I speak for the whole group, for everyone who is here today. And I want to thank uh, everyone who joined us, Sir Pietro, uh, Sir Eric, uh, Sir Seamus, Sir Joffrey. And most of all, I want to thank Vesper. Behind the scenes, helping all of this happen uh, is Vesper of Atlantia, who is helping to facilitate this whole meeting sending us out on this Facebook Live and who did all of the work behind the scenes on the advertising and promotion. Uh, so thank you so much, Vesper. This has been awesome. Look forward to more of these. Uh, we might be involved and it might be different groups of people discussing different topics, um, but there will be more videos coming soon. So thank you all for joining and it has been an absolute pleasure. Have a great day.